So welcome to The Engineering Room, a monthly series of long-form conversations with influential people from the world of software development. The Engineering Room is sponsored by Equal Experts, so I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. And if you'd like some help to build great software or are interested in finding a great place to work, do check their links in the description below. My guest today is a principal engineer who helps companies to evolve their engineering culture tame their bottlenecks and maximise their throughput of value. He's always interested in searching for better ways of working and is interested in exploring the ends of the spectrum, as he puts it. He helps teams and organisations to try out sometimes counterintuitive ideas that initially don't always seem like they make sense, but surprisingly end up as working very well despite that. To that end, he conducted some fascinating research looking into the use of pull requests as a means, amongst other things, of organising code reviews. He analysed over 40,000 pull requests over a period of two years. Some of his findings are really fascinating and very hard to refute if you're a fan of pull requests. He enjoys connecting the dots between extreme programming, theory of constraints, system thinking, lean and socio-emotional technical topics. That's a mouthful. I particularly enjoyed a presentation of his that I saw not only bracketed, bracketing his arguments with data, but also where he described a sound, intellectually robust model for why things worked, not just presenting some flavour of his personal preference. I'm pretty sure that he and I are going to get along very well indeed. Please welcome Dragan Stefanovic. Thanks, Dave, for having me and really looking forward to this conversation. It's a it's a pleasure and and... I think I, I think our paths have crossed before, but but I remember seeing your you do your presentation at Newcraft the Newcraft conference in Paris, and was was blown away by some of the data, and and have wanted to talk to you since then. It's kind of the 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 use case for other forms of code review, which I'm sure that we're going to get into our conversation. But I thought a nice place would to start is that I know that you like I. I'm a uh, long time proponent and have a background in extreme programming. So how did you come to that? And, and, and what was your experience of extreme programming? How did that inform what came later? Yeah, so I've been part of XP, I would say for 15 years now, definitely. And it's one of the things that they still enjoy, I would say the things are changing in our industry so fast, as we know. But these are one of the things that are kind of um, really, really um, it were important for me, in a sense. Um, I think it, as a way of working and, and the mindset that it creates, it's it's a really different thing than compared to what they had before. And uh, yeah, uh, there have been different things that I have been working with um, after that, in the sense of the fields that I got to be interested in, lean theory constraints, etc. But I would say last maybe five to 10 years, I started connecting the dots between these fields and there's so much overlap between those, which I find really interesting and, and fascinating. And I think that's also how this whole thing about the async code review study that I did came about because I started connecting the dots somehow in a really um, real world. Um, use case. So yeah, I kind of also use XP as a way to um, something that that I think um, is is really important as an engineer to have um, under your um, tool belt or as part of your toolbox, so to say. And it has helped a lot to, at the end of the day, create a really meaningful working relationships. Um, yeah inside of the teams and create value sooner and also have joy along the way, which I think is one of the things that we often lack, unfortunately, in our day-to-day -day work. Um, so yeah, that's that's a bit about uh, about XP and um, my kind of history with it. And I still love it and I'm really kind of I'm still fascinated and discover things around it, looking at it from different angles than before. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a really, really interesting journey, I would say. Yeah. It's, it's it's fascinating. I, I I have I have similar stories to tell, but but I I I'd, I'd agree with you enormously about the the impact it has not just on the technicalities of doing the work and also the challenges of of thinking differently about how we approach our work, which I think you touched on, but also the joy that it brings, the the the, the pleasure and the social impact 
the by far the strongest relationships that, that I built with my co-workers over the years have been on teams that, that worked in that kind of way, but by a long way. Um, and and that, that's, that's as a side effect of working in this more collaborative, more human-focused, but more disciplined way of doing work, I think. Which is which is interesting. There's, there was a lot in what you talked about. I, the, the stuff about theory of constraints and and um, lean thinking, it always intrigues me. I've, I've met some of the very early adopters of extreme programming, including Kent Beck, and I'm never quite sure how theoretical they were or whether it was just purely pragmatic discovery. Because because it certainly is, a, a, you know, it certainly was in part, you know, a, as far as I understand it, a a pragmatic approach to just doing things better and just solving the problems in front of them yeah. one at a time. Um, but certainly from my perspective, looking at it with the benefit of a few decades of hindsight now, it seems it seems to me that there are some really deep reasons why this stuff works better than anything else. Yeah. Um, I think it's also interesting because... Um, yeah, it's very counterintuitive. I think that's the thing that people had a very hard time um, grappling with, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and we tend to try to prefer things that we feel are intuitive compared to the things that work at least slightly better, I would say. Yeah. And another point that connects XP and also theory of constraints is also theory of constraints, the um, Ali Goldberg, father of theory of constraints, so invested, I would say, three to four decades trying to give this idea that the common sense is not often common, so to say. Yeah. And um, and I think that also it's it's like a gem, I would say, that is like from one side, I feel sad about the fact that it's not as adopted as I would expect after this many years. Yeah. But then on the other side, because I think also people miss out on all of these things that I got to get from it. The joy of working, the productive relationships, achieving things sooner and delivering delivering value sooner. Um, but then on the other side, I also feel it's a competitive advantage for the companies yeah. and teams that get to understand how valuable it is and how different it is. So, which is really interesting because it's it's very hard to stumble upon it if you try to discover it on your own or if you just try to follow what 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 is the the loudest voice in the industry i would say um yeah and, and that's also like a, a provides a bit of um so to say it's, it's like a blue ocean strategy in a sense that it, it's not as discoverable as you would expect so from that perspective I, I feel it's also a really strong competitive advantage and also for creating engineering culture that that is very much different it's like a parallel world than what you yes. get to in 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 teams that work in isolation and you know throwing things over the wall and heavy planning for the next six or uh, months or twelve months or whatever is the case. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, definitely a parallel universe. Yeah, I, 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 and I, I think I think that's important because I, I I use slightly different language, but but I talk about about it. So so I think I think the stuff that I promote, continuous delivery, is second generation extreme programming. It's it doesn't take anything away from extreme programming. It just talks about it differently really and kind of extends the range of the same ideas to my mind and so 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 i you know i'm i, I it's deeply informed by by extreme programming and but i i think that both of those approaches represent a genuine paradigm shift it's a complete change in focus not only about how to practice software development but really what software development is you know it's it it you know i, I think People like you and I think of it much more in terms of it being this exploratory process of discovery. And part of the way in which we organize our work is to enable that, to allow ourselves the freedom to discover things, to learn new things, to change direction, to discard the bad things and all of that kind of thing. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favourite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform.
to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>